uh, we can we can see you. Uh, okay, great. Your, your screen is almost. Uh, oh, I thought your screen was starting again. Okay, but we can see you. Yes, I will restart it. Okay, sure. Okay, are you able to see my screen? Uh, not yet. We seeing the window activation uh, screen sharing, but not mm -hmm. yet started. Not yet. We uh, we just waiting. Still That's loading. Great. Still loading. Yes. yes. <laughs> it is still loading more. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, we can just go through the slides a little bit slower to make sure that they um, load properly. But yeah, um, hello everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, thanks a lot for inviting me to give um, this tutorial today on recurrent neural networks and sequences. Um, yeah, so um, also um, hello from um, the US as well. Um, it's quite early in the morning at the moment, but I heard you already had a big day today. Um, and so to, is it still being slow or it's still I just loading. changed the slides? Okay, um, let me try something else where I'm only sharing a single screen and perhaps I'll turn off my own video um, and see if that works better. Good. Are you able to see it now? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Great. Perfect. Okay. Um, great. So to, yeah. So today, um, we will um, first cover the motivation. So why sequences matter, and why should we be interested in um, models like recurrent neural networks. Um, we will also then cover some of the fundamentals. So here we will talk about some of the main architectures um, that are used for modeling sequences, mainly focusing on RNNs. We'll also talk about how to compute the loss and um, how to actually update and optimize these models. And lastly, we'll cover a couple of examples and applications of um, sequence modeling, specifically to also generate um, data as well. But yeah, let's get started with the motivation. And so, so far, um, I'm sure like you have seen feed forward networks and convolutional networks and in the tutorials before this one. And so some of the topics that we will be covering today, recurrent neural networks, um, build on top of on what you've learned before. Um, but um, those networks are actually not so great at modeling sequences. So what is a sequence? Um, a sequence is a collection of elements where the elements can be repeated. So you can like think of it as like, say like the frames of a video. Um, and these sequences can also be a variable length. And um, so they might have um, 10 elements in them, but they co could also have like um, a million in them. And um, so if you know that that's like, um, a sequence, you can see how um, a feed-forward network or a convolutional network may not work very well because they expect fixed um, length or fixed size inputs. But why should we still be interested in um, sequences? So um, maybe I can like um, ask and you this question as well, and you can like um, feel free to also post on chat. So what are some examples of um, sequential data that could um, that come to your mind? Feel free to speak up as well. <laughs> 
I'll give a couple examples over here. So even the sentence itself, why do we care about sequences is actually a sequence. It consists of several words um, that are a sequence. And then you can actually look at each individual word where each word consists of characters, which again um, is a sequence as well. And the slides in this presentation form a sequence. And there are plenty more examples of sequences as well. So if we, the most obvious one um, is like words and letters and say words in a sentence, but then also if you think of audio or speech, um, that's a sequence as well. It's a sequence of waves. We talked about videos, um, which is a sequence of frames. Even images can be seen as sequences of pixels. When you look at programs, um, the program statements can be seen as a sequence. And also in uh, many other fields, say like in biology, we have um, DNA, we have proteins, which oftentimes can also be represented as a sequence. So there are lots of examples of um, data around us um, that is in sequential form of variable length. And it would be really great if we could also do um, or build models on top of that. For example, to do an inference or to do generation. And um, here I see some um, in the chat and um, someone wrote heartbeats over time. Yes, definitely. So um, that would could, for example, um, be used for if you wanted to build a heart monitoring system to, um, for example, to detect anomalies. And um, that would um, definitely be a sequence as well. It's um, somewhat similar to sound too. The Monachi numbers and words. Yeah, thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the, the suggestions as well. Um, yeah, so um, we will come back to some of these applications later as well. I also wanted to give um, one education example, which is something that I um, worked on myself before when I was still um, in grad school. So um, the goal for this um, research project was to understand a student's knowledge and um, while the student was trying to solve um, a programming exercise. And the goal of that was um, to, for example, to decide when to show a hint or to show a lecture video and um, say like when they're stuck. And so as input, what we got for the modeling part was a sequence of programs. So this is like showing you the sequence of programs which um, the student has submitted over time. So this is all for solving the same exercise. And so we also used um, recurrent neural networks as we will see later um, to um, model the student's knowledge. So this is just another example of sequence data. So just in summary, sequences are collections of variable length where the order matters. If you imagine like a sentence, if you change the order, that would have a totally different meaning. Sequences are really widespread across machine learning applications and not all deep learning models can handle sequential data as we talked about like with feed forward networks and continents, those can be used to other kinds of data but they're not suitable for sequences. So hopefully you're all now motivated to learn about um, models that are designed for modeling sequences. So we'll now cover the fundamentals of um, the models and how to optimize them. So, so far you've seen supervised learning examples in previous tutorials. In supervised learning, we usually have pairs of data where we have um, input data X and then there is a target Y that we are trying to predict. And in supervised learning, we're provided both so we can use um, the signal from the targets to compute a loss and optimize the parameters. And we usually have like some model Y is approximately F of X where this F of theta is our, our for example, our neural network. And the theta are the parameters. And theta are the things that we're trying to learn and optimize. Um, the loss is usually defined as like um, a function between um, what we're predicting and what the targets are. And we can just sum over all the examples. And we minimize this loss to, um, to optimize the theta. And um, what we will be um, showing now is like how we can model the probability of a sequence. That's like we're um, the first type of task that we will look at. In this case, um, I wanted to just like highlight that here we actually don't have the targets necessarily. We might just be provided uh, a corpus of like text, and what we're trying to what we're trying to optimize is the probability of those sentences appearing. And um, so in this case, what we're modeling is the probability of X. 
and for now just assume that X is a sentence um, and we're trying to learn a model that approximates this probability. And the last function would be defined as um, the, um, the sum of log probabilities. Um, and what we're trying to maximize is, the, um, is this probability. So you could always also take um, the negative arc min um, of the loss, that would be equivalent. So let's take as an example input for x, modeling work probability is really difficult as our input sentence. So the simplest model that we could come up with is just to multiply all the individual word probabilities. So this would be the model that we'd be using, which is like um, P of X, so P, the probability of the whole sentence, we just assume that it's the product of um, the word probabilities. And word probabilities is something that you could um, compute if you have a large corpus. So if you have, um, say, a huge corpus of um, the English language or some other language, we could calculate how often a word appears and calculate a probability based on that. So for example, the easiest way would be to count the number one word appears and divide it by the total number of words in the corpus. So then you might come up with things like um, the appears with a probability of 0 0.05. But unfortunately, this is not actually a great model because if you, um, for example, if you were to ask a question with this model, what is the most likely six word sentence, you would end up with the, 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 because um, the independence assumption does not actually match the sequential structure of language. So clearly this sentence um, that we got is not a particularly good or particularly common sentence, but um, this model um, that we are trying out here would say that this is the most likely sentence because these individual probabilities would be maximized. Um, yeah, so this hopefully motivates you want to try out on some other models as well. I'm going to just check if there are any questions. Also feel free to post um, questions on Zoom anytime or interrupt me. Um, I see there's Q&A. Um, oh, I think this was from earlier. Our time series, those examples of sequence data. Yes, they definitely are. And um, those, um, that's a great example of um, sequence data. So as a more realistic model, if you want to actually take some of the structure of the sentence of the input into account, we can try to assume conditional dependence of words. So say like um, the probability of the next word depends on the previous, or we condition that probability on which words have appeared right beforehand. So now um, if you see uh, um, that right before you had the word the, most likely you're not going to follow and follow it up with another the because it's really rare or probably never the case that in natural language you get two thus following each other. So you can see how conditional dependence might help us here. So now what we're trying to do is like given say like and the previous five words, so modeling word probabilities is really to so condition on this what we call context and now try to predict the probability of um, the different candidates. So um, now we might actually get that like difficult, the word difficult here, this candidate has the highest probability. So this is the P of X given the context. And now if you wanted to calculate the probability of the whole sentence, and um, so that's like the joint probability P of X, we can do that um, from the uh, individual ones, from the individual conditionals by using the chain rule. So we can expand this P of X, which is the whole sentence into the product of P of um, X1. So like that's the probability of the word modeling, then P of X2 given X1. So that's the probability of having um, the or modeling being followed by word and so on. And then we can multiply all of this together. But how do we actually get these probabilities, like these conditional probabilities? So we will quickly actually run into some scalability issues. So to illustrate that, say like if you wanted to know um, or calculate on um, the pairwise or like um, the conditional probabilities with um, context length one, as in like we are only conditioning on the word that comes right before it, not even on two words or three words, just on a single word, we already end up with um, this matrix this, um, for four words. 
Um, and so we mentioned earlier that we can calculate these probabilities um, by using counting or counting words and co-occurrences in a corpus, but um, we would have to construct a um, 2D matrix um, for um, the context length equals one case already. So you can see that it scales quadratically. Um, so what this matrix is um, showing is like the probabilities, for example, for modeling, following the word modeling or the um, probability of word following modeling. So these are the probabilities. But as you can imagine, as we increase our vocabulary, because we don't just use four words, we use um, millions of words, uh, then we quickly run into um, scalability issues where this matrix of probabilities you have to construct gets really huge. And that is um, just what we're showing here is like just for context of size one. Um, and we mentioned earlier that it would be nice to have like actually larger context. So if you can condition on like the previous three or previous five words, but if you um, scale by the larger context, then it'll actually grow with um, the size of the vocabulary to the power of N. And so quickly that'll get us to a point where uh, we would have to compute more probabilities than there are atoms in the universe. So clearly that's not really feasible um, for what we are trying to do. So there are some ways of um, addressing that. One option is to make the context or fix it to a smaller context by using n grams. So n grams, um, the n stands for how many previous words we're looking at. And here, if we, we can constrain ourselves to only say like, look at the previous two words and we never look um, further um, beyond that. So if we only condition on the previous um, two words and we only need to construct, um, say, these um, matrices of um, dimensions three, um, which helps it with um, exploding in terms of dimensionality. Um, but um, yeah, so, but even so, even if we constrain our n grams, we still end up um, getting very, very large data tables, and um, it's still um, not ideal. So um, the problem is also that um, if we constrain ourselves to a small context, we will quickly lose or forget on um, what happened earlier. So if you're trying to, for example, um, predict on a, um, say like on an article, and if you only use um, two words of context, you don't, you wouldn't take into account what was said in the previous paragraph. And sometimes for modeling text, and you may actually want those long-term dependencies. So n-grams would not take that into account. And here's also an example. This is like from, um, from the Google Translate team back from 2006, when they decided to share their n-gram data set with the world. And um, they focused on um, just using n-grams of, um, I believe it was um, size five, um, five word sequences. And they only, so they went through a lot of data and um, they only kept the five word sequences that appeared at least 40 times. And still they ended up with this huge number of sequences. So hopefully that shows that this is um, still not a scalable solution. And so just to summarize, modeling probabilities of sequences scales pretty badly um, given the non-independent structure of their elements. And because they want to be able to take context um, into account and long-term um, dependencies as well. So this leads to the question, can this probability uh, estimation be learned from data in a more efficient way where we don't have to construct these um, enormous tables? Just going to see if there are any more questions. Thank you. Um, so this is just a reminder of on um, how n-grams worked. Um, so if you take um, the previous two words into account, what we can do instead now is like to vectorize the context. So what that means is like, um, what we're trying to learn is um, we want this modeling word probabilities is really, so that's like our context. We want um, that to be represented by um, some vectors. We want to learn um, this f of theta such that the output is this, um, embedding or this um, hidden vector H, and we want H to summarize the context. So in other words, you want to model this conditional probability X given the previous words um, as um, P of X given H. So we want to replace this 
previous context with um, the vector h. So um, actually, before I show you the desirable properties, um, can you think of some of the undesirable properties we um, want for this, um, for this function f of theta? Feel free to post on a chat again. So think of like, what are some, what are some things that we want this function f of theta to take into account? I see um, word length. Yeah, so um, it would be good for it to um, to actually, or use like the sentence thing or be independent from that. Um, so let's take, a, let's take a look at like some of the properties that we would want for this function. So you want the order to be taken into account. We want this function to give us a different representation if the order of the sequence changes. We also want it to be able to handle variable length sequences. So we want it to be able to encode on, um, for example, sentences that have 20 words, but also sentences that only have three words. And ideally you want this function to be learnable as well. And so such that we can learn the parameters theta. We also wanted to be able to handle um, the case where individual changes can have large effects. So imagine if you add the word not to the sentence, it can change the meaning entirely, can even flip the meaning. So you want those um, small changes to also have large effects in the um, hidden embedding in this um, or how this vector h um, ends up. Does that make sense so far? Great. Again, feel free to ask questions anytime. Yeah, um, great. So these are, um, so in addition to that the order variable length that it should be learnable, um, we also want um, that it preserves long-term information. And so that's especially important when we're trying to do language modeling over um, longer sentences or paragraphs. So let's take a look, of, uh, look at um, our previous method that we discussed. Um, imagine if we were to use n grams as our f of theta, what um, of these um, things it um, covers. So order matters. n grams do take that into account um, because they condition on what comes before. Um, the variable length, um, it doesn't actually um, do so well with that because n grams, just by the way it's defined, it only takes into account n words. And so it's always two or always three words. It's also not differentiable, and it's based on, on counts. And it is like a pairwise encoding, so that part is met, um, but it does not preserve any long-term information because it only looks at such a small context. So let's look at another possibility for um, or for doing f of theta and for um, encoding the context. We could just um, add um, the um, say like the individual probabilities or other representations for these words together. If you add everything together, you get um, one hidden um, or this one context vector h as well. And if we look at um, the properties of that. If you add all everything together, um, you're actually losing the order. Because then you can imagine if I were to like change the order of the words, I would get exactly the same h as output. It could handle variable length pretty well though, because you can add any number of um, words and word embeddings and it would be fine. It is also differentiable, addition is differentiable. Um, it is not really a pairwise encoding. And um, it does, but it does preserve um, long-term information in some ways because you could theoretically add everything together. And um, so in some ways, if you look at the properties of addition, it's um, very complementary to n-grams, but we are looking for a method that can meet um, all of these requirements at the same time. 
So we just talked about like that the first step is um, about vectorizing the context, like that's on our first step. And then the second step is like once you have this context vector H, what you want to do then is like we want to have um, another function, another model, G of theta, that can give us the output. So in this case, you wanted to, for example, predict the next word in the sentence, um, like difficult. So so for this g of theta, there are some desirable properties. And um, we still wanted to also um, take into account individual changes and that can have large effects. And we want this g of theta to return a probability distribution over potential candidate words. And we can look at later how we can make that happen in our models. So to summarize, um, we looked at um, we looked at the requirements for the types of um, models that we want when we're modeling sequence probabilities. And we also looked at some simple examples of in engrams and aggregation, which um, unfortunately do not meet the requirements for modeling sequences. So this um, brings us um, to um, the next part is like, how can we build a deep network that meets our requirements? And um, there's a question by variable length, do you mean the whole sentence length in this instance or model? And um, oh, so by variable length, we're we're actually talking about that the length itself can change. And um, I realized that the word variable is kind of overloaded here. So um, what we mean is like it should be able to handle a sequence of length five or a sequence um, of length 20, and both of those should work. Did that make sense? So variable length, in other words, is like um, flexible length or changeable length. And it would be um, the length of the whole se sentence or sequence. OK, so let's continue. So how can we build a deep neural network um, that meets our requirements? So this brings us to recurrent neural networks, which um, are still um, a very commonly used model and for modeling sequences. Um, so let's cover um, what this recurrent neural network um, looks like, what the architecture is like. And um, the core idea of an RNN is that we uh, um, have a state variable H that stores um, the information from the context that it has seen so far. And this um, state variable H gets updated each time a new input is being fed in. So we start off with um, the H0, so the, that's like our initial hidden state. And then we feed in the input or feed in the first word of the input. So for example, modeling, and we multiply it by um, the weight matrix X. So we multiply the input by weight matrix X and um, the hidden vector is multiplied by um, WH, that's another weight matrix. And those get summed together, get passed through a ton H activation function. And then we get um, our new H. So that's our H1. Um, these numbers here represent the time step. So H0 was like our initial one, H1 is like at um, the next time step. And these Ws are parameters of the model, and these Ws are learned um, by a backpropagation. And after you have um, gotten H1, so like um, the next hidden state, um, if you want to get an output from that, so for example, modeling or predicting what word should come next after modeling. So this, is, this was our first input, and now we want to predict um, an output. So this part um, corresponds to what we called our function g of theta earlier. So given our h of 1, we have another function. Um, so in this case, we multiply it by w, y. So that's another weight matrix here. Um, pass it through a softmax. This is our softmax function. And um, to get a probability distribution or to get some distribution that sums up to 1 over candidate words. And, and that'll give us, an, and then if we take the arc max of that, so um, find the word that has the largest probability, we can predict um, the output here. The y1 is the output. So um, yeah, so that's like, and um, um, if you were to express it um, mathematically. 
and then we can continue. So say if we wanted to continue what comes next in the sentence, we would um, take what was predicted. So a word, we take that output and um, feed it in now as an input. So now that's set to x1. And we do the same thing again. So we multiply by wx again with um, the input by wx and we multiply the hidden state h1 with wh and um, this will give us um, the next hidden state h2. So one thing I would like to point out here is that these wx's here, so this wx and this wx, those are exactly the same weight matrices. So we apply the same weight matrix wx to every input word. And same thing with the WHs and WYs. So those stay the same over time. And we can continue this process. So we predict the next word probabilities and then we feed in that word probabilities as X2. And we do the same thing again, update our hidden state, get H3 and we can continue just like that. So that was a really important bit about um, RNNs. Um, definitely feel free to ask me questions uh, now as well about um, just to make sure that we are all on the same page. Okay, so for RNNs, um, there are oftentimes two ways that you can represent them symbolically. And um, this is like the condensed version of it and where we show this is our RNN model with our three weight matrices that we talked about. And, and this little loop here is indicating that we're um, recursively looping over um, the hidden state so that we're updating the hidden states. You can also unroll this representation. And so this is and what we saw earlier. This is the unrolled representation where we show the uh, um, inputs over time and the hidden states over time. And these Ws, and they stay the same over time. So these two representations are equivalent. There's just like one condensed version and one unrolled version. We also call this um, that the weights stay the same over time. We also call this weight sharing over time steps. This will become very important as we look at on how to update these weight parameters. I'm going to quickly check if there are any questions. Wx equals Wx um, and Wy equals Wy, but is Wx equals Wy? Um, no, so Wx and Wy are different weight matrices. And thank you for this question. So all three weight matrices are um, different from each other. Okay, so let's look at the last function. So when we're predicting the next word at every time step, that's essentially like a classification task where the number of classes is the size of the vocabulary that we're predicting over. So this um, is probably similar to what you've seen before in previous tutorials and um, for classification tasks. So we will use the cross entropy loss. That's like the most uh, natural loss to use for classification. And so for a single word and um, what that loss would look like um, is um, where the loss is like given the true y, so it's like the ground truth in um, our data and um, the predicted y, y hat is the predicted y, we can calculate um, this um, to get the cross entropy. And if you wanted to calculate the loss for the whole sentence, we can simply sum up over the individual cross entropies. And this theta over here um, is um, essentially the combination of um, these three weight matrices. Because theta is like just our short form for parameters and um, it's parameterized by these three weight matrices. So now um, what we would like to do is being able to differentiate with respect to wy, wx, and wh. Differentiating will allow us to compute gradients, and those gradients um, we can use to update these weight matrices. So again, this is um, the same idea as for feed-forward networks um, or for convolutional networks. So um, to actually figure out how we can differentiate and calculate the gradients, we have to look at, um, or let's remind ourselves of like the individual steps. And um, so let me also just check if there are any other questions. Um, okay, not yet. 
exactly. So um, yeah, so we saw these equations earlier. So um, to calculate H of T or like to update our um, H of T to get the, the H at the next time step, we calculated from the previous H of T, so H of T minus one times the um, WH, and then we also add WX times XT. And then we take the tan H over that. Then to get the output, we're calculating the softmax. So now, so once you have this output, so P of X T plus one, and so this is essentially our Y hat, and then we can calculate um, the loss from that. So let's first look at how we can calculate the gradient with respect to W Y. So this is um, this weight matrix over here. And um, this is relatively um, straightforward. And um, so if we have um, the loss for at this particular time step and um, with respect to WY, so you see how like the um, signal, the loss signal is just coming in from here, from the Y, um, from y at T plus one, we just um, back propagate into WY and that is just um, Y, um, I won't read it out, but that's just like this expression over here and we're done. So this is the gradient with respect to WY. And you can use um, the gradient rules um, you've probably seen before um, to calculate the gradient. So um, some important rules are like the chain rule. So now let's um, take a look at how we can differentiate with respect to WH. This one is a little bit more complicated, and that's because, um, as you may remember, this WH is being applied repeatedly many times um, for different at uh, different time steps. So um, let's try let's try differentiating it. Um, so as we're calculating the loss with respect to WH, we first um, have the um, loss with respect to Y. Then this is again using a chain rule. And so the um, loss with respect to y hat, then we have um, the gradient or the partial derivative of y hat with respect to h of t. So that's like with respect to this um, um, this variable over here. And then we have the derivative um, of h of t with respect to wh. And this one is the one that is um, going to be a bit more um, complicated because we have to unroll it. So as we see, this WH is being applied repeatedly. And if we want to calculate the gradient, we can't just calculate the gradient with respect to one of them, but we have to add up the gradients with respect to all the times the WH appears um, in our computation. And um, so this part is probably the most complicated part. And um, so I will just um, pause for a second here to see if there are any questions. Um, okay, the question is, please pardon, you mentioned that differentiating helps to what? Yeah, um, so differentiating, um, differentiating means that we're calculating um, gradients and these gradients will allow us to update the parameters such um, that we can minimize the loss function. And um, so imagine if you, like in the simplest case, like say if you have like your, um, a quadratic function that looks like a parabola and you would like to find the minimum of that, we can calculate um, the gradient um, at the spot where we are at. So like at a particular X that we're currently at and um, the gradient would allow us to move um, further into the minimum direction. So the, um, um, what, yeah, because like, um, the gradient shows us like in which direction is it um, steepest. So it's the um, differentiating is like the main way how we update um, deep neural networks. Okay, so let's take a closer look at um, this last partial derivative that I mentioned um, we have to unroll. Because this um, WHT with respect to WH, it's actually also with respect to the previous time steps as well. So you have to add it over the, um, the partial derivative of H of T with respect to H of T minus one and so on. So, and we have to go all the way back to the very beginning of the sequence. So to write it in close form, this is the sum um, of the partial derivatives of HT with respect to all the different time steps, previous time steps, HK, and um, the derivatives of um, HK to WH. <clears throat> 
So the sum uh, depends on where in the sequence we are. And this is definitely like the, this is the most complicated part uh, of the math. And um, the main goal for today is like to just get the intuition and you can come back to um, these slides or this presentation and um, to um, figure out the details as well. Yeah, so um, so we covered um, differentiating with respect to um, WH, and um, now we can also um, look at, um, yeah, so one issue that comes up with like um, differentiating with WH is um, the vanishing gradient problem. And um, so if H of T, or if HT um, is very large, or say like if it goes to, um, Apologies. So if WH um, is larger than one and we differentiate over time because we are multiplying by it over and over again, um, this HT will um, tend towards infinity. And also the other way around, it'll go towards zero if WH, um, if the magnitude of it is smaller than one. And that would lead to vanishing gradients. And this is an issue um, because um, as we like, this is an issue because if we wanted to um, learn our model and our gradients are exploding or vanishing, then we actually won't be updating our model properly. So if the gradients are vanishing, that means we're not changing the parameters, so we're not learning anything. And if the gradients are exploding, it would mean that um, it would make the model really unstable. And so we also wouldn't learn anything either. So this is like a problem that um, we encounter with RNNs. Um, and this is this slide is um, showing you an example of um, what that actually looks like um, more specifically. So this is an example for, let's just say our sequence is um, length 10. So we're looking 10 steps back where we're calculating a gradient as 10 steps back. We're starting off with initial state H0 of 0 0.5, and um, we're going to calculate um, for different weights of W, uh, different um, values of W, what the RNN state H looks like and uh, what the gradients look like. So as we're changing the weight W, we can see that um, our H is like nicely bounded between zero and one. And that's because we have this 10 H function around it. This 10 H makes sure that all the output values are um, between those, um, those values. And, and then if you look at the gradients, however, those gradients are um, only in a good um, area around um, minus one and one. Uh, negative one and one, and for all other regions, and um, it's essentially zero. So if our um, Ws are in the zero regions, um, we are um, not in a great position to update the model. So this is just to illustrate on um, how or how easy the vanishing weight and problem can happen. So to address this vanishing gradient problem, um, or actually like to summarize first, and um, so we looked at um, n grams and additions, and let's uh, look how RNN um, does on um, our requirements for this model. So um, RNNs do take order into account, and so that's good. It can also deal with variable length sequences because you can unroll an RNN as many times as you want. It is differentiable by design. And um, it does not support um, pairwise encoding, and it also doesn't preserve uh, long-term information because of the vanishing gradient problem. Um, because of the vanishing gradient problem, we cannot have very long sequences. So in summary, um, RNNs can model sequences of variable length, and they can be trained via backpropagation. So backpropagation is there is this process of calculating gradients and um, offer loss function with respect to the parameters and updating those parameters. And um, so that's backpropagation. They do, however, so these RNNs suffer from uh, this problem, um, which um, stops them from capturing long-term dependencies because we can only do RNNs on shorter sequences. I'll just pause here and see if there are any questions. And again, those um, formulas, they can oftentimes see, uh, seem daunting when you see them for the first time. And um, so um, feel free to come back to this um, and think about it on your own time. And um, I'm sure that they will make more sense um, after that. Um, 
yeah, so the goal again for today is like just to get the intuition for it. Um, I don't expect anyone to like fully understand exactly what's going on with the math. And oftentimes with like things like understanding gradients, it's best to work it out yourself on paper. And um, so just try to like um, figure out what are the gradients by um, calculating the partial derivatives and doing it by hand. And that can really help um, deepen the understanding. Okay, so um, why do we want long-term dependencies though? So we mentioned that um, our nuns are not good at them, but um, why do we want that? Um, so let's look at this little um, example of our um, paragraph from, say, like from um, a book. And finally, Tim was planning to visit France on the final week of his journey. He was quite excited to try the local delicacies and had lots of recommendations for good restaurants and exhibitions. His first step was, of course, a capital where he would meet his long-term friend, Jean-Pierre. In order to arrive for breakfast, he took the early 5 a.m. train from London to what do you think? What should come next? Any thoughts? What do you think? London to which city? Paris. <laughs> um, yeah, looks like you figure it out. And um, and the people who said Paris, how did you figure it out? What were the main words that stuck out to you? What is the context you use? Yes, France was mentioned. And capital. So with this, France and capital, you could um, derive that um, he's going to Paris. And as you can see, this is actually quite a big context that you had to take into account. It's like a lot of previous words that you needed to see in order to be able to derive that this is Paris. Um, so yeah, so this is just to illustrate that long-term dependencies matter quite a lot if you're trying to generate, say, a consistent um, paragraph or do um, good language modeling. Paris, yeah, <laughs> most of you got it. So how can we capture these long-term dependencies? So essentially we would need to like um, figure out how we can adjust the vanishing gradient problem. And because that was the main thing that prevented RNNs from modeling long-term dependencies or having longer term se input sequences. So here's like where long short-term memory or in short LCM networks come to the rescue. Let's remind ourselves of um, the RNN state update. And um, so in an RNN, again, we have like this little block over here and uh, three different weight parameters um, or three different weight matrices that we use to update. For all CMs, um, it's, it's mostly the same idea. Um, it's a little bit more complicated on the inside. Um, just bear with me, there, there are a lot of gates going on, but we will go through them one by one. Um, but overall, it's like a similar idea where we're repeating. So we have like um, a hidden state HT minus one and that we're updating. Um, so that was like for the RNN and for the LCM, we're adding an additional cell state. So in addition to the H, we also have an S um, that gets updated over time as well. And again, because of this little subscript here, the T minus one, this is just to indicate that this is changing over time. We call H the hidden state and C is our cell state. The cell state um, is the one that um, uh, helps us preserve um, long-term dependencies. So it helps with like both the, the long-term memory, but it can also um, forget as well. Um, so we're going to look at these individual gates that are used to make that happen. So first let's look at this forget gate over here. What this forget gate does intuitively is it controls how much gets passed from the previous time step, um, from the cell state of the previous time step to the cell state of the next time step. This forget gate um, outputs a value between zero and one. 
And um, so it essentially just means that um, if it's zero, then we're going to forget everything. So this um, CT will not depend on CT minus one at all. And if it's one, um, then we would um, remember everything. So CT would be the same as CT minus one, uh, or like it would um, have a lot of information from CT minus one. So that's the forget gate. It controls how much we remember. And then um, if we forget things, we also want to like um, add some new information from this new time step XT. So XT is like our input. And um, so there are um, two gates that help us and determine what information we want to add to the cell state to update it. So say like if the forget gate was um, one, so we remember everything from before, we might still um, add additional information from XT to get the new cell state. And um, how this works inside of here. So we come up with like a, we can also say like a pseudo cell state. So that's our cell prime um, that's based on the hidden state and the uh, um, and the input XT. So this is actually quite similar to what we had in the RNN. And in addition to that, we also have its own little forget gate over here corresponding to the pseudo cell state that says like how much of um, this cell state we want to add um, to update CT. So if this forget gate is set to zero, then also we would not use any of the pseudo cell state. And then we also um, need to update our hidden state as well. So we just talked about how to update the cell state. So now let's look at the hidden state. And this part um, is also quite quite similar to um, what we did in the RNN. So it relies on the previous hidden state and our new input XT. And there's also an output gate um, that we uh, um, and we take the cell state into account. So as you can see, there is a signal that's coming from here, from this side, and there is also a signal that's coming from above, and this is um, from the cell state. So this is CT. So we take CT into account when we're calculating the next hidden state. So you see that there is information flowing both from HT to CT as well as from CT to HT. More precisely, it's flowing from HT minus one to CT. So overall, um, this is the L LCM state update, and um, it is a bit more complicated than the RNN, but it allows us um, to address the vanishing gradient problem because now we have um, the cell state where gradients can be passed through more easily. And also it depends on a lot more, um, there are more gradients in between. So you're less likely to always multiply by some number that's very small or some number that's very big because you're multiplying by more or multiple different um, numbers parameters as well. And um, so this a little bit more complicated and um, set up with gates and to calculate the cell state and the hidden state allows us um, to address the vanishing gradient problem. And you can actually also see intuitively that there is a way for a lot more signal to be passed through directly here through the cell state. And so that's the long-term memory part. And the forget gates, and um, those are responsible for the short-term memory part because um, it can learn to also forget based on the input. And all of these gates are parameterized by weight matrices that it can again be learned by a backpropagation. Okay, so let's continue. And um, there are also GRUs, so it's just another architecture. We won't dive into the details here, but you can think of GRUs as a simplified uh, architecture of um, LCMs. Um, they also address the bench and gradient problem, but it has fewer gates. And, and this was developed much later than the LCM. And you can also see that it only has one hidden state, um, so it doesn't have the cell state. And there are some cases where um, you want to use um, a GRU, but there are also some perhaps like other um, applications where LCMs still make more sense as they have more capacity. So let's look at the properties of LCMs if we were to use that as our F of data um, and compare to the previous methods we looked at. So the LCM, as we mentioned, um, it's 
essentially like an RNN and it preserves long-term um, information dependencies. So um, long-term to some extent, it's still not like, um, probably like if you go to like um, a thousand, 10,000 words, it might still be challenging, but um, it's doing a lot better than RNNs. So you can increase the sequence length. Okay. So to summarize, LSTMs and GRUs, um, these two new model architectures that we looked at, they overcome the vanishing gradient problem by making um, use of more sophisticated gating mechanisms, um, which influence that um, we're not always just multiplying the same thing over and over again. Um, and as a result, these models are more um, ubiquitous and they are used more widely across machine learning research and applications as well in industry. One example of that, so coming back to like um, this little um, example uh, or this little research problem that I showed before, um, which um, which I worked on myself with a few collaborators, we also use um, LSTMs for that. Um, so in this case, we have our programs, um, these student programs as our inputs over time, and then we first calculate program embeddings. Um, so that's essentially with our WX, although this, um, this part is slightly more complicated than a single weight matrix. Um, and then we have our hidden LSTM state that we um, update over time as well. And at each step, we're um, predicting uh, an output. So this is very similar to what we've seen before, but instead of words as input, we're passing in whole programs as input. And we did observe that by taking the whole sequence into account, we were better at predicting um, whether the student will succeed on the next exercise or not than if we were to, for example, not take the sequence into account and just know whether a student has solved the previous exercise. So taking the sequence into account um, did seem to help. Okay, so let's um, go towards our last um, section of this um, tutorial where we will look at generating sequences. So we talked earlier about like how we can model um, the context and how we can uh, um, model this H and um, uh, or generate words at a time, but let's look at some more applications of that. So um, during training, we talked about um, updating our um, our parameters to optimize our loss function and to optimize specifically the log probability that's estimated by our model. And then at test time, we can also use that to evaluate on the probability of a new sentence. Um, but that is actually not super interesting. What we're more interested in is like to be able to um, generate whole sequences. So um, we talked about how we can, um, given an input, we can generate the next word, where this is um, going to be a probability distribution over possible words, and we can take the arc um, max, or we can sample from it. And um, so um, if we sample from it, it's like not always going to be the same word. And once we sample the next word, we can um, pass it in as the input um, to the network again, and we can continue just like that. And you can generate sentences, you can generate um, whole paragraphs with this approach. We can also actually treat images as sequences. So we can look at these pixels as sequences as well. And, and for that, what we can do is like, um, we say like given um, all of the previous pixels so far, like all the blue pixels, let's predict what the next pixel XI should be. So we condition um, XI on the previous pixels. So that's like what this is expressing over here. So say like we start off with the first um, pixel here and then we generate the next one and so on. And then we can just keep generating pixels. Um, and then as you can see, like as if we are given this is our input and we're trying to predict the next pixel, there's like a pretty high chance that it should be green. So you see a pretty narrow probability distribution. Well, if we're here, um, now we're like at the boundary of colors and um, the model is less certain what the next pixel should be. So you can see that the distribution that it outputs is rather wide. And, and as it gets um, past this boundary, it becomes very narrow again. So it's like a more 
confident model is like another way of looking at it. Um, and these outputs on there, we also call a softmax sam sampling because um, the last layer is a softmax layer and um, which outputs on um, this um, distribution that looks like a probability. And you can just continue and, and generate a whole image. And um, it turns out that like in this approach, this is actually from quite some time ago, from five years ago. Um, back then, this was um, pretty impressive where you can generate images just um, one pixel at a time um, that produces pretty realistic looking images. There are definitely better methods nowadays too, but this is just to show how ornaments can be used on images. The um, application area we um, talked about before is like natural language is probably one of the uh, most obvious ones um, and um, there are actually many ways how you can um, how you can do sequence modeling on language. So um, we will we also call these sequence to sequence models. So if you have like say an input sentence, you want to predict an output sentence, or if you want to generate um, text one word at a time. And there are a couple of variations of that um, that I would like to show you. So there is a case where you may want to like um, uh, encode a whole input sentence, so say like the red sentence over here, before you start um, outputting um, predictions. So the whys are the predictions. Can anyone think of um, an application where you want to first encode your whole input before you start outputting an output sequence? Or in general, can you think of um, can you think of sequence modeling tasks in language? What are some other sequence modeling tasks that you can do with language? Like besides some generating a sentence. Machine translation, yes. That's a, um, that's actually the one I was thinking of, and that's a really great example. Are there any other ideas? What are some other um, language tasks you can do? Some others could be text summarization that could also be like your um, useful thing um, or potentially mapping from um, say a more complicated version of English to like an easier version or and so on. So that's also similar to translation. Yes, and so like this example over here um, is exactly what one would do for translation. So say like if you have an input sentence for example, in English, sequence is sequence, and you would like to translate it to Japanese. And um, so in this case, um, we would um, encode the whole input sentence first before we start outputting. So at this point here, um, the goal is that H3, the second state, contains information about the whole input sentence. We now feed it to H1. This is the decoder um, part. Um, and now we start predicting um, the output sentence. And so this would be the first word in Japanese. Then we feed in, we use the same approach that we saw before for generating sentences. So we take the um, predicted first output, feed it in as the next input, and then um, predict again and continue the same process until we hit the end. So um, again, to summarize this part, the red part is what we call the encoder. And the blue part is what we call the decoder. And this approach is still um, widely, widely commonly or widely used um, in translation models. There are also many uh, other examples of how we could do sequence um, to sequence modeling. And so there's like, um, the um, we start out with the simplest case, which is one to one, then you can have like a single input, but you predict a whole sequence of outputs. We can also have many to one, meaning we have a sequence of inputs, but we only want a single output. So that could, for example, be if you um, have a, um, you feed in um, movie reviews and you want to output a score or output whether this was like a positive or a negative review. So the whole entire sentence would be mapped or paragraph would be mapped to a single output class. 
We talked about uh, many to many. So does a say, um, say if you generate a sentence in a single language. And we also talked about many to many, which is um, the, the other form of many to many, which is what we saw in the translation example. Oh, yeah, a couple more people have um, posted in chat, text classification and sentiment analysis. Yes, those are all great examples. So um, yeah, text classification, so that could, for example, be the many to one example and sentiment analysis as well. Um, you could almost say that sentiment analysis is a, a specific application within text classification. Yeah, very good, thank you. Feel free to also post more there too. Um, great. So if you look at the literature, um, sequence to sequence has been used in a variety of applications. Um, we talked about machine translation. It's also used for image captioning, which is pretty cool. So it's like your input um, is an image and then we want to um, output um, a description of that image. That's a caption. It's used for speech modeling um, or speech as well. So say like um, given processing speech or producing speech um, for parsing and um, for creating dialogue and um, to generate videos and also for geometry as well. So lots, lots of applications of sequence to sequence. So let's um, look a little bit closer at um, the translation model. So um, this one is um, what's used inside um, Google Translate, which um, maybe some of you have um, used before. And um, this, this one is like particularly good because one of my close friends actually works on it. Um, yeah, so in the Google Neural Machine Translation Model or for short NMT model, um, we have our encoder and decoder, what we saw before. So this is like the encoder part. Um, it's also interesting that we, uh, we mark the sentences with like this little end token. And then after that, we pass it to the decoder and um, output our translated sentence um, after that. And um, as you can see, sometimes the input sentence can have a very different length um, compared to the output sentence, and we want it to be able to handle that as well. And, and adding or making the translation models um, neural networks, so adding this neural network part to it really improved the quality by a lot. So before that, um, the Google Translate models were relying on phrase-based models and so not using deep neural networks. And after the neural networks got introduced, um, they um, increased the quality gap by a lot. So the gap between the old system and human quality translation, so the yellow bar here is showing human quality was an um, improved um, or um, um, it was like improved by a lot. For image captioning, so this example is like we're given an image and we want to output a caption. So in this case, the caption is a good boy and for this a cute little puppy over here. And so the way that works is we're actually combining on two neural network architectures that we have both seen now. So um, first we pass it through some kind of content, which is like optimized for processing images. So that will output an embedding of the image. And this embedding is then fed into um, the RNN by feeding it into um, the hidden states. So it, it influences um, how the hidden state is initialized. Um, yeah, so you can also train these models end to end, meaning once you have um, this model set up and you connect the convolutional network with the RNN, you can um, backpropagate through the whole thing because everything here is differentiable. So um, we can learn the confnet together with the RNN. In other words, instead of conditioning on language, um, so this would be like the translation version, so like um, language one, condition language two, what you would do is like we are conditioning on an image. Yeah, and um, you can, you can see how the, um, so say like for this image over here, um, a human said that a brown dog lying laying in a red wicker bed and the best model predicted a small dog is sitting on a chair which is pretty good um compared to say like the initial model that said a large brown dog laying on top of a couch 
yes, it's pretty impressive what these models can do now. And you can imagine how this can, for example, help um, say like if and um, for blind people or um, if you have um, a YouTube um, or some video that you would like to caption and make descriptions for. So um, this could potentially be useful for that. And I'll skip over this part. So there's just another a couple of examples of image captioning. Um, a person cooking some food on a grill. So these are all pretty good. And this one is actually interesting because um, this, you could say that this is like an out of distribution image because it's pretty rare that you see someone holding a banana in their face or who knows, maybe it's not so rare, but um, so you would say like, this might be an image that the model has not seen before. Um, a human can pretty easily um, generalize and say that it's a woman holding up a yellow banana to your face. But honestly, it's pretty impressive that the model was also able to say that as well. A woman holding a banana up to her face. And the initial model is really bad on this one. It says a close up of a person eating a hot dog. <laughs> so um, yeah, so it didn't generalize well. Now we can also look at audio waves of sequences. And so I mentioned at the very beginning that um, audio waves are essentially sequences as well. And um, so you can, you can zoom into the audio waves too. And um, so for this, particular example and um, we're using WaveNet and um, so this is actually not an RNN it's actually more like a convolutional network um, that looks at a fixed window um, of inputs at a time but this is a moving window so you maybe you look at like um, 10 seconds of um, the audio and then you shift that window um, through time to predict um, the next um, to predict the next output. So this allows you to do speech generation as an example. Um, so I think this is still pretty interesting. So it's like, it has like some inspirations or similarities with RNNs, but it's um, in its most basic form, it is more like a continent where um, you have dilated convolutions. So as you go towards the output layers, the convolutions become um, wider or they look at a larger window um, and it, it allows you to pick up hierarchical signals. So it's a pretty cool architecture. So if we were to compare that um, to the other models, this type of um, WaveNet or convolutional based model for modeling sequences, um, it um, fulfills the first three, but it doesn't actually preserve um, long-term information that well. It's, it's like a half tick because um, you can shift the window over time and it can look at a relatively large window, but it's still a fixed window. And lastly, and um, we'll briefly touch on transformers. Um, so transformers is the architecture that was um, developed in 2017, and it's now super widely used everywhere, especially also for modeling sequences. So now if you look at, um, if you, for example, use Google Translate, um, pretty much all of the translation models have a transformer encoder. And um, also say like Google search and other, um, these are just the main things that I'm familiar with and are also relying on transformer models. Uh, so transformers have really taken over um, and they're not, um, so those are actually not RNNs and it's a different type of architecture. Um, we won't dive into like the details for it, but I'll just like briefly cover some of the core ideas um, of transformers. The core idea for transformers is attention. So it's relying on an attention mechanism. Um, another, um, or to compare to like the convolution. So in convolution, we have a fixed window. And um, so say like we are always looking at three inputs at a time. And um, there, so we always look at a fixed window and then we predict the next output. For transformers, we actually take all the inputs into account. So you can see how there is, um, so the bottom thing here is the input and the upper thing part is the output. And so we're taking all of the inputs into account and how much we take each individual input into account is actually and um, depends on the input itself. So this part is like the core idea, that's the attention part. So attention means like how much should we pay attention to um, the first word versus the second word versus the third word and so on. So we, de um, we decide in real time what to pay attention to as you're predicting the next word 
And so say like for translation, what that means is like if you're, for example, um, at the word, um, if you're about to predict the verb, um, you should be paying attention to what was the verb in your input sentence. That, so that would be one example of how attention could be useful. So in transformers, we have no recurrent state. We don't use any convolutions either, and there is no external memory. We solely rely on this attention mechanism to encode and decode a sequence. And this attention mechanism itself can be learned, so there are parameters in that um, in the attention. So we can still learn it via um, backpropagation. And um, and also just to um yeah, so just to remind ourselves convolution weights are fixed. So these weights, as you can see, they always say the same. This is indicated by the colors. They always say the same. While the attention weights, they change depending on the input. So how much we take a particular input into account depends on the input itself. And um, so it's like, for example, for predicting this part, it seems like these two inputs were the most important ones. So transformers are um, really impressive in some ways. Um, they are quite large models. Um, so GPT-2 and GPT-3, so those are models that were developed by OpenAI. Um, they're language models um, that can um, generate um, text that look almost um, identical to what a human could write. Um, yeah, at least like for shorter paragraphs. If you go to like longer paragraphs, it might be more difficult. So it has 1.5 billion parameters, which makes them really large. And there are some issues with having large models like that, because um, it takes a long time um, to train these models. Um, and the data set was also quite huge. So that's like just for GPT-2. Um, you can also look up GPT-3, which is a more updated model. This is an example of what GPT-2 um, generated. So the input that it got um, was this little paragraph here, written by a human. In a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorns spoke perfect English. So kind of, kind of funny um, prompt over here. And then this is what the um, what GPT-2 generated. I won't read everything, maybe just the first paragraph. The scientists named the population after their distinctive horn, Ovis unicorn. These four horned silver white unicorns were previously unknown to science. So you can see that this is actually really well written. It, um, I feel like it could have been written by a human. Um, it's um, in a similar style. Um, it uses um, perfect English grammatically and it flows pretty nicely. And it actually is able to generate multiple paragraphs that are um, relatively self-consistent. Um, so yeah, so this is definitely quite impressive. Another example um, that's built on top of transformers is actually AlphaFold. Um, so this is a relatively recent, um, or um, the, you may have so seen some announcements about AlphaFold um, in the last couple of days. Um, the first, um, um, or AlphaFold V2, was first like, announced back in um, December, December, where it beats um, the CAS competition. So what it does is like given an input string describing a protein, it can predict its 3D structure. And the reason that this is um, really useful is that it can be used in structural biology for things like drug discovery, um, for example, for deciding whether or for predicting to what extent um, a drug might be effective and which proteins might interact with each other. So it's a really useful tool in biology. And, and so far, the main ways of people have um, done this is usually in the wet lab through experimentation and um, do, doing crystallographies. So being able or having a model that could predict that fairly accurately, like a structure fairly accurately, um, could potentially really help um, research in um, structural biology or in biology in general and chemistry. So um, yeah, so this was, um, this is actually a pretty um, big um, advancement um, and the core of the model um, is inspired by transformers. So it builds on top of transformers. It is like a slightly more, um, uh, it's like not exactly the same architecture, but it shares um, some of the similarities around attention. 
And what you can see here on, on the left side is a figure that shows um, how um, the experimental results, so the experimental prediction, how um, it aligns with the um, computational prediction. So experimental result is like um, what um, you got from the wet lab. So people actually um, doing this in a wet lab and then um, scanning what the resulting protein looks like. And the blue parts are, uh, or the blue is showing what um, AlphaFold um, predicted. So you can see that they actually align really well, which is exactly what we would want. And to the right is like a structure that was um, predicted um, for a particular um, protein. Um, so this is the output of the model. And um, your, you can actually look up AlphaFold um, V2. Um, if you just look it up online, you'll be able to find more resources about it. Um, so a couple of days ago, it was announced that um, a database of um, the protein structures that were predicted with AlphaFold and has been released. So you can actually go there if you're interested in biology and look up all sorts of different protein structures um, that have been predicted. Yeah, so that's actually, um, I think, a really exciting application of machine learning um, and also of like um, sequence based models. So, um, yeah. And the code actually for that is also open source. So um, let's look at the transformers. Um, so they actually fulfill all the requirements that we're looking for, which makes them um, an ideal model for, trans um, for modeling sequences. They, um, so the pairwise encoding, what it means is like it actually, for every output, it looks at all the um, inputs. So we essentially have like um, a pairwise encoding for every possibility of pairs. Okay, so um, as we look at um, the evolution of language modeling. So back in 2011, when we had RNNs, um, this was like an example of some text that was generated. While he was giving attention to the second advantage of school building, a two for two stool killed by the culture saddled with a half-suit defending the Bartia colonel's office. That still sounds really weird or like it's um, it doesn't really make sense. So that's um, not very good. Like grammatically, it seems to make sense, but um, the actual meaning is not there yet. Well, in 2019 with GP2, given um, an input prompt, um, Mari Cyrus was caught shoplifting from Abercrombie and Fitch on Hollywood Boulevard today. The model predicted or generated, the singer was wearing a black hoodie with the label blurred lines on the front and fashion police on the back. So that's pre pretty, pretty impressive. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's like how much has changed in a couple years. So to summarize, and um, so we're at the end of um, this tutorial today, um, we started off with motivating why um, sequences are interesting data to look at because they're everywhere, but also that modeling them is pretty difficult with the architectures we've learned in before in previous tutorials. Then we covered on um, a couple of different approaches to model sequences. We covered Ngrams, RNNs, LSTMs, and um, in the last bit, we also briefly touched upon dilated convolutions in WaveNet and also transformers. We also talked about um, the requirements that we have for these different models um, or desired properties. So the um, models like the um, LSTMs and also transformers um, are really flexible and can be um, applied to a wide range of tasks across machine learning. And um, so we saw that like there are a lot of different applications um, that we can use these models for um, to generate, um, to translate, to summarize, to classify text, and so on. So um, I hope that this was um, exciting to you and um, that you um, learned something from um, the tutorial today. And um, so I would like to thank you for your time and for your attention, um, <laughs> no pun intended. And um, yeah, feel free to ask any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Miss Lisa, for, for that beautiful presentation and uh, for also how you handled it, uh, well done.
So we wait, we can give it uh, more two, three minutes and uh, we see if we have any questions to take uh, before we can call the session off. Mm -hmm. Also just wanted to give um, credit to you on Marta for on these slides as well. Yeah, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. So as we wait for the questions to come in, a quick reminder again, okay? Uh, tomorrow by 8.30 a.m. East African time, uh, we shall be having an introductory part to Zindi platform before we kick start uh, on the hackathon. So ensure you make time, make it in early so that you don't miss on the relevant information that will help you in achieving or accomplishing the task that you might have at hand uh, during the hackathon.